The Falklands conflict originated in Anglo-Argentine rivalry, rivalry over the Antarctic region. That rivalry had, prior to 1968, focused on Antarctica itself, but the Antarctic Treaty dislocated it. The claims in the Antarctic region were frozen. What was not frozen was the question of sovereignty over the Falkland Islands and her dependencies. Those dependencies were a bit of an embarrassment to the British government. For the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, they meant a restriction on the ability to trade with South America. For the Treasury, they were a drain on resources. And for defence, nobody really knew what they were there for anymore. As it was, the failure to deter and the failure to understand Argentine claims and will to act over the Falkland Islands meant that when the, the Argentines did invade in 1982, it became as a strategic shock to much of the British military and the British establishment. What came next was a scramble to get a task force out of the UK and headed 8,000 miles away to the bottom of the world. That scramble was led by the Royal Navy. Admiral Leach famously responded to Margaret Thatcher's discussions on whether we should or could with a response that it wasn't a question of should or could, it was a question of must. This was a conflict that the Royal Navy both had to fight and had to win. It was, st looking, it was staring down the barrel of a gun in the terms of the NOP review, uh, published in 1981, a review that was going to remove its carriers, remove its amphibious capability, and was going to see it reduced to a supporting role for any uh, future war in Europe. This was a conflict which, in many respects, was perfect for the Royal Navy at the time. It was going to be fought at reach, both from its own bases, but also from its opponents' uh, sources of power. It was going to be against a position that could be easily isolated. The Falklands were an, are an island chain. It is going to be difficult for anybody to reinforce them. And it was going to be fought against an opponent it knew well, against whom it had a qualitative, if not quantitative, advantage. And it was going to be a war that was going to be primarily naval in character, if not in nature. For the Royal Navy then, for the Royal Marines, this was it. This was going to be their moment in the sun. But nobody expected there to be war. Indeed, throughout April, the flurry of diplomacy led by the US to try and stop two of its allies going to war with each other meant that until everybody reached Ascension Island, actually very few people thought this would descend into a shooting war. The 1st of May changed those expectations. Attacks on British shipping, the sinking of the Argentine cruiser Belgrano and the establishment of an exclusion zone around the Falkland Islands meant that this was now a proper shooting war. And that came home with a jolt both to the population in the UK and to those servicemen who up until that point had not believed that this was possible. For the British, the war really consisted of three phases. The first was the establishment of local sea control through the uh, exclusion zone and the winning of the air sea battle above and around the task force. With that still in question, it was then a case of trying to move in and conduct the amphibious assault and amphibious landings at San Carlos. Having established a beachhead, it was then a case for the land component to move on and fight the battles that would see the liberation of Stanley. Throughout the conflict, the Argentines proved themselves in the air to be exceptionally professional and proficient. The Royal Navy suffered significant losses. Four ships, frigates, destroyers sunk. A landing ship logistic sunk. Atlantic conveyor carrying the entirety almost of the, of the land component helicopter uh, transport was also sunk. And alongside those losses, came the human costs of war. The same can be said for the Argentines. The Belgrano suffered 345 dead at least. It was, in many respects, a tragedy for all those concerned. This was not a war that anybody had envisaged fighting. It was not a war that anybody was ready to fight. 
The so what of the Falklands conflict really comes down to three aspects. First, that it's provided Margaret Thatcher with the political acumen she required in order to win the next general election with a landslide. It really cemented her place as the first British Prime Minister since 1945 to have won a conflict. Um, and that cannot be understated. Uh, it changed the dynamic in the British populace. Britain went from being the sick man of Europe to being one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And it is significant in terms of the Royal Navy. The cuts of the Not Review were reversed, the Royal Marines were saved, and the amphibious task force demonstrated to the USSR that not only did Britain have the will, but the capability to launch and sustain operations against a hostile coastline. Horizontal escalation, a mere byword of the concept pre-1982, was proven to have credible teeth. The big so what is what happened to the Falklands afterwards. The Falklands became ever more integrated into the United Kingdom, its citizens gaining full British nationality. The economy, which had been restricted prior to 1985, owing to tensions with Argentina, was liberalised. And self-government was devolved down onto the people of the Falkland Islands. With that self-government came a referendum. Did they wish to be part of the United Kingdom or part of Argentina? A referendum which the Yes Camp to the UK won by, by over 90%. Tragically though, all war comes with a human cost. 255 British service personnel and civilians were killed during the war. 650 Argentine servicemen lost their lives. And for both sides, there were, there were close to a thousand, if not more, wounded. In the aftermath of the conflict, it was a British officer, Geoffrey Cardozo, who first gathered, recorded, and then buried Argentine dead on the island with full military honours. Unfortunately, that information was not given to the Argentine families by their own government. His actions have been recognised latterly by both the Argentine families, the Argentine government and the United Kingdom government. Interestingly, he was not the only person to be honoured on both sides for their actions in the war. Surgeon Commander Rick Jolly was also honoured by the Argentine government for the work that he did with his surgical teams, saving the lives of Argentine wounded.